Hey security peeps, it is Renee Small and we are back again with Breaking Into Cybersecurity. Our, I'm here, I'm back with my infamous co-host Chris Bolan. Chris, say hi. Hey Take everyone. Off. And we also have our guest today, Gabby Hempel. Say hi everyone. Hello. So Gabby is actually, usually you'll see, usually see three of us on here, but Gabby's on the phone today. So you're only seeing two of us, but she is, she is live and ready to uh, answer all of our questions and your questions. So we are excited to have her because she has an amazing background um, and she'll jump right into it. She, uh, she also broke into cybersecurity through one of the, the main places where she got her education is through Cybrary. And we both, Chris and I love Cybrary and we love the information that's provided on there. So, you know, I will let Gabby speak for herself. So Gabby, tell us what were you doing prior to breaking into cyber and what made you think about cybersecurity as a career? Yeah, I have a little bit of an unconventional background here. Um, I studied neuroscience and psychology in college and kind of went into the pharmaceutical regulation route after that. Um, I did a lot of, you know, review for FDA regulated studies and um, and it was anything from like pharmacokinetic review to more of the regulatory side of things, just depending on the nature of the study. And then, um, you know, I had a couple of studies with medical devices that had vulnerabilities and those were always the most interesting ones to me. And I kind of fell down the rabbit hole of, okay, I'm interested in why these are vulnerable. Can I learn more about this? So started doing more of the, I, a little bit of um, data governance and just data regulation in terms of like part 11 and HIPAA compliance within my old company. Um, then eventually decided that yes, security was something I wanted to learn and started looking more towards, okay, let me see if I can get a job in security. Do you, um, which aspect of security do you like? The people, the process, or the technology? All of it. Um, I There are mixed reviews about the community at times, but I think in general, the people are really great. And I've found a lot of teamwork is needed in the community. And I really like that. Um, I like the technology too. I like that every day we wake up and there's something new to learn or something new that we can get our hands on and start to investigate and um, yeah, no, people and technology definitely is the m most gratifying part of the experience, I believe. And then just kind of once you combine the two and you realize that, okay, I do love threat hunting and I do love pen testing and I do love, you know, picking apart code to see what's vulnerable and what's not, then you kind of realize, okay, this is what I want to do. Wow. So Gabby, I want to take a step back to your background. So um, <laughs> that's pretty fascinating that you are in this space in the you know in the medical industry, looking at medical devices, looking at in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, did that correlate? So the the role that you took after you after you got into cyber, is it still in the medical field or is it in a different industry? No, it is not. Is it? It's in a completely different industry. It's just in consulting in general. So we have a lot of different clients. Wow. It, is the role similar to uh, the compliance or risk assessment that you might have done um, previously? Because hearing your story, I was like, oh, she would probably do great in a compliance type role. But then, then you talked about how you love pen testing and everything. I'm like, whoa, that's a total 180 right there. <laughs> Yeah, it's really not. Um, the compliance, it, I guess it could help a little bit. Um, my background in it, just understanding what's obviously vulnerable, I guess, in different client environments is helpful. Um, and like what, you know, some parameters for compliance are very strict in some environments and then not as strict in other environments. So like getting to work with a variety of clients, 
in my current role is really nice because I get to employ a little bit of that knowledge, but honestly, no, um, my role is pretty much solely a stock analyst. So I do a little bit of everything. Um, not really anything compliance related or risk assessment related. That's a completely different area. So definitely made a huge leap. Um, not much in common with my previous roles. Wow. So when you decided after seeing those vulnerabilities and said, hey, this is really interesting, how did you get to, how did you get from saying, hey, this is interesting, I want to learn more, to where you are today? Like, what was, what was the first step that you took? Um, part of it was just annoying my old boss and saying, hey, I want to learn more of this. Um, and finally, he was like, fine, do, do what you want. You know, um, he's like, as long as your job's getting done, like you can add on more responsibility, you can learn what you want to learn. And it was just really exploring, reading as much as I get my hands on in the environment that I was in, and then decided to supplement my education, um, kind of took a look at what resources were available out there for cybersecurity. And it's an interesting, it was an interesting search. It's kind of a niche field you know, you can go out there and there's a billion websites that'll teach you how to code or, you know, how to get started in coding, but there weren't quite as many resources saying, okay, this is how you get started in cybersecurity. And a lot of the frustration was everyone that I talked to that did work in cybersecurity kind of came from a really long technical background. Um, they had either been, a lot of people that go into cybersecurity were military, and they, you know, got their on-the-job training there. And then once they got out of the military, they were obviously qualified for high-level cybersecurity roles. But everyone else, yeah, they kind of were like, oh, I was help desk, and then I moved on to sysadmin, and then I moved into network. And it was this linear journey. And it was an interesting time trying to find resources that would show me, hey, you can do this without necessarily the traditional linear journey. We hear that all the time. I know mm -hmm. and I, one of one of the reasons why we started this is because there are so many people giving that type of advice, and so we. I mean, this is the reason why you're on here today, because there were so many folks that reached out to. They would reach out to Chris. They would reach out to me, and say, "Oh, I'm being told all of this different advice, um, and we want to hear." you know, like I just went and got a master's in cyber, why should I go back and, and, and be a help desk and assist admin and all these various things to break into the industry? So I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the areas of advice that people get from people. People get that advice from folks who've been in the industry and started years ago. Um, and it's very different now. So. So what sort of resources did you find um... And how did you go about evaluating what was helpful or not helpful during your search? Yeah. Um, at first, this is ridiculous, and I laugh every time that I say this, but I went to Reddit. Um, they have a really big network security community on Reddit, and it seems ridiculous, and people are like, what are you doing on there? Um, it's not really what you would the kind of community you would think of when you thought of like professional networking or trying to educate yourself. But um, there was a lot of recommendations for Cybrary on there. Um, and I kept seeing it pop up, Cybrary here and Cybrary there. So finally I was like, all right, let me check this out. And I did, and it was actually prior to when they released the career paths that they have today. Mm -hmm. It was more just, hey, this is how, you learn about cybersecurity. It was like right at the beginning of when they were starting to develop the career paths. So um, I was like, okay, this is the first resource I found where it starts from the really basic level. A lot of the stuff that I had found prior had either been for people that had worked in the field for a long time or had done this for a while or were at least somewhat like technically literate. I was technically literate in the sense that I used a computer at work every day, but that was pretty much it. So not anywhere ahead of anyone else. I was pretty baseline in that aspect. So um, yeah, just 
I was like, okay, like this starts with A plus. And as you guys know, the CompTIA A plus certification is, it's your basic, this is a computer and how it works. This is what <laughs> the inside of the computer looks like. This is, I mean, it, it just, it starts with the very, very small building blocks, which is kind of where you need to start. I mean, to draw a parallel to my background, when you study neuroscience or psychology, the first thing you start with, the first like two years of learning neuroscience is learning about things that happen on the cellular level. You can really draw a comparison to computer science and say, hey, okay, like you need to understand what's happening, you know, at the bit and byte level, at the binary level, before you can understand what's going on network wide, security wide, etc. Um, so yeah, sorry for that tangent, but no, cyber. I no, I mean, <laughs> I think that's and, awesome. yeah, that that's awesome, and I think that's also why sometimes you'll you'll find the um, experienced individuals say, "Hey, start out in the help desk." Is kind of for that reason because maybe uh, the on the job training will teach you all those things, but if you have the drive and the determination to go out and to learn those things and apply them and um, be able to take that experience and move up quickly, then going the route that you're doing um, is definitely a, a way to go. How would you say you handle the ramp up period to going from nothing to knowing so much more in your SOC analyst role? Oh my gosh. Um, part of me still feels like I'm kind of in the ramp up period. It's been a very long journey. Um, over, I mean, I started in June in my SOC analyst role. And so it's been what, seven, eight months. And there are still days when I'm like, okay, like I know a lot more than I knew when I started, but I still, you realize how much more you have to learn. And I've heard that also in a lot of fields. I think the, the more you learn about something, the more you realize that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty daunting, but it was really, it was like cramming for an exam in college. It was crazy. I just tried to get my hands on as many resources as I could. Um, Cyber, I'm a big book person still, which is weird for someone in the tech industry, but I like reading books. So any books I get my hands on, uh, blogs, websites, um, even like the InfoSec Twitter community is really active in like sharing mm -hmm. um, different articles and things that can help you learn. And I think just, I really just tried to immerse myself in as much as possible. And it, I'm sure anyone around me at that time was super sick of it because like I would be cooking dinner and like, I would be listening to um, the security now podcast or another podcast that mm -hmm. went into information security, or I would be driving on my commute every day and just listening to eBooks and stuff like that. And it was just a total immersion let's see how much information I can absorb in a short period of time. Yeah, that's that, so uh, good with us. That curiosity and that drive is, is definitely, um, I think, what makes you stand out from the rest. And if you can tell a, a potential hiring manager that this is what you do to try to either learn more or to get into the industry, it definitely separates you from others that just go down the certification route or just go down the education route. I mean, being in the industry that long, it's still what I do. I, I listen to, to, I don't know, 30 plus podcasts a week. I listen to uh, technical audio books uh, during my commute. Um, I never stop learning. And I think that's the only way that, that you can truly be successful is have that curiosity and drive to keep learning and to know when you don't know something. and be humble to admit it as well. Well, especially in a field that changes every day. I mean, you can listen to a podcast that came out last week and this week there are so many things that almost supersede that. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Um, it's definitely an industry where you do, like you said, need to be humble when you don't know something and kind of just inundate yourself with information. Otherwise it, you're going to fall behind. It's so um, you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, and curiosity is the number one, um, the number one request I hear from leaders. When they, they say, you know, there's certain things you can teach and there's certain things that they can't teach. And probably every leader has said that passion, that hunger, that curiosity, like, 
how do one of the one of the questions that I know comes up very often is what Chris just asked, like how do you get your information? How do you keep abreast of the industry? Because like you said, something happening last week completely changes this week. You know, tomorrow it's something else, it's something new. So, you know, having that that drive and that that curiosity bug to keep digging and digging and going down a rabbit hole is what makes a great security professional. It is, and I'm sure you guys can speak more to this, especially since you deal with, you know, people that recruit for these types of positions a lot. But I'm finding that, at least as far as I've seen, curiosity is starting to get you super far in this field. I think a lot of hiring managers are realizing, okay, like I need some, I can teach anyone cybersecurity. Um, And I've even had current management say this, you know, you can teach anyone networking or how a system works, but you can't teach them to be interested in it and you can't Mm -hmm. teach them to be engaged in it. And um, I really do, I felt like during my job search and journey, that was something that continually set me apart. And I guess when there was someone that I was up against that had a lot more experience than I did, it was something that even the playing field a little bit. Do you mind going into your job search? Like um, how how many different places did you apply to? How many different interviews did you go on? Um, Explain your journey. Very many. Um, Gosh, I applied to so many roles. And I mean, God, if I could count, it would probably be in the hundreds. Um, And I started my job search in October of last year, not this past year, but the year before. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was all winter, just trying to teach myself everything while also applying for things and interviewing for things. And there were quite a few times when, you know, I would have two, three, four interviews with a company and get to the very end and they'd be like, hey, you were super great. You are second choice. But Mm -hmm. there was someone with more experience or whatever. And it's it's always going to be that type of journey where you, you may not always be the best person for the job or the person with the most experience. So it's really leveraging, you know, your interest and curiosity in the field. And a lot of um, I get a lot of questions about, you know, how did you tailor your resume to jobs like this when you didn't have any experience working in a job like this or any certifications relevant to the field? And one of the big things was really just detailing the things that I was doing on my own, saying, okay, you know, this is what I'm learning. Um, I had a section on my resume for this. These are the certifications that I plan on studying, and this is the date that I plan on getting it by. I want to get this certification this year. Um, I want to work towards these things. And that would, I think, pique their interest enough to where they wanted to talk to me. And then once we had a conversation, it was me saying, yes, I'm using Cyber to learn these things. This is the thing that I'm learning right now. Uh, You know, these are the certifications I want to work on. These are the things that I'm doing to better myself so that I can be competitive for a role like this. And I think that goes a lot further than people think in terms of making themselves marketable for a job. Yeah, so um, that's so impressive. I think that you sharing this information with others is going to be so very helpful to them. I mean, we, we've heard consistently over and over that people have had to apply to hundreds of roles and interviews in dozens. Um, I don't think any, I don't think I'm still looking at anybody that's interviewed for a hundred in a hundred different places, but definitely into the thirties um, with interviews. And I think some of the points that you make, it's it, it it will definitely help the folks that are coming up that are probably feeling frustrated after applying and interviewing and coming up second so many times. Um, before we started the call, I know you talked about persistence. And if you could, you know, provide us or provide the audience with, um, you know, what kept you going, um, knowing that you, you absolutely wanted to get into the field after applying to hundreds of roles and interviewing and coming up second, you know, over and over again. So. Yeah, the more that I learned about the field, because, you know, at the time I was applying for all these roles and interviewing for these roles, I was continually trying to learn more. And 
the more that I learned, the more I was like, I need to work in this field. I need to find a way to get into this field. And it was, there were times when it was super disheartening, especially when you, you know, get to the end of like a recruitment process and you'd be one of two and you wouldn't make it. Or, you know, there would be a job that you spent a really long time. There were a couple of times when I spent time tailoring cover letters, which, I mean, is that even a thing anymore? Um, <laughs> like, yeah, if, if there's a job I wanted really bad, I'd be like, okay, like, let me write a good cover letter. Let me, like, really make this application stand out. And there'd be times when it just, I felt like it probably didn't matter. Um, and at the end, they were just like, yeah, no. And that was really disheartening. So it kind of became one of those mental battles where you have to say, okay, this is what I really want to do and I'm not going to stop anything to do it. And it's a lot of goal setting as well. It would be me saying, okay, you know, I'm going to apply to, I'm going to find five jobs I really want to apply to this week and apply to them and like really work on making my application stand out. And then it's the follow-up after applying and even after interviews is so important. And I think that's something that's overlooked as well. Um, you know, touching base with the people that you just talked to on an interview and saying, you know, I really enjoyed speaking with you. I was super happy to learn more about the job. Let me know if you have any questions about my resume. And um, also getting resume feedback was really helpful as well, saying, even if I didn't get the role, I would be like, okay, thank you for letting me know. What can I do to make my resume more competitive for a role like this in the future? If this is the role that I want to be in, or this is the field that I want to be in. And nine times out of 10, they were more than happy to provide feedback and help me kind of tweak things to, or even just give me suggestions, say, hey, you should learn more about this. Um, and if you want to do this type of work, and it was just, at that point, it was making connections with people, even if I knew the job wasn't happening at that moment, because networking in the field is important. And um, just, yeah, doing everything that you can to make yourself marketable and memorable and just really staying on top of the job hunt um, is kind of what I meant when I went into persistence. And it was a mental battle at times, but at the end, at the end if, if it's what you really want, you need to continue to work for it until you get it. So, From um, being in the, the hiring manager um, side of things, you, you, you touched on a, a couple of points that, are th that I think are very critical. Um, you talked about what you were curious in, what you're doing to get there, as well as the soft skills of following up, creating that connection. Um, you'd be surprised how impactful those two things will have on an interview that they can see, okay, while this person is curious, they might not know it all. I can, I could probably trust on them that they will continue driving along and figuring out what they need to learn and they'll ramp up really quickly. And then on the other side of things with that communication and creating that connection is that they would be able to talk to the audience that cybersecurity caters to the, the users and be able to communicate effectively to them and share that message with them as to what they can do to help um, solve the problem. Because this, us security professionals is just one part of the problem. Every, the business, the users, everyone else is involved and being able to communicate to them is critical. I can tell you, I, to add on to that, Chris, um... You know, I, 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 I'm actively recruiting right now in, in various uh, roles. And I had a person recently, two people actually, who were so persistent. I mean, every two weeks or every week, I had one person who would just follow up and follow up and follow up. He came, he interviewed for a company. The company was on the fence and they said, no, mm, you know, that what, what we say in recruiting is keep them warm, meaning keep the person kind of available, you know, like keep in touch with them, but we don't know if he's going to be the right fit. And this person followed up consistently every two weeks. He was not a pest, but every two, I would be like, oh, follow up in two weeks. And two weeks to the day, he would follow up after maybe two months or so. I, I, I went back to the hiring team and said, 
this person has been consistently following up every two weeks. Do you not want to consider them? Consider him? Lo and behold, he, he ended up getting that job. Same thing with another young lady. Same thing, you know, continuously following up, saying, I, I'm very interested in this company. And at the end of the day, hiring managers take that so much into consideration. People don't understand. I think they end up getting offended. You know, some people, they may get offended or discouraged or what have you. But my mom used to always say, persistence seldom fails. <laughs> if you want it bad enough and you reach out to these people enough and at some point, somebody's going to quit or something's going to happen and there's an opportunity there and you're the person who's been following up, then you're likely going to be the one to get the job. So awesome, awesome um, stories, feedback, experience, all that stuff. And, and even from the technical side, the fact that you persist on following up means that you would probably dig into a case yeah. and figure out why it's happening and keep digging in and digging in because you have that feeling that uh, you're going to get to the bottom of this and you're, go you're going to eventually figure it out. And that's the kind of drive that you're looking for. Exactly. Yeah, especially in the security industry. I mean, half of, depending on whether you decide to kind of go offensive or defensive, a lot of it is getting to the granular um, aspect of things. And I think being persistent shows that, okay, like this person's going to do what they need to do until they get to the result that they need to get. Absolutely, for sure. So Chris, I know we're, we're down to our last four minutes. Um, Chris, you wanna ask your final question? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Gabrielle, if you had one piece of sage advice that you would give to anyone listening, going through this journey themselves, what would it be and um, share that with our audience? It kind of goes along with what we were just talking about. I think really the best advice I can give to people is don't give up. And it's in a lot of different aspects. You know, don't give up applying to places. Don't give up following up on things. Don't give up on educating yourself. Um, I think you could, people really under, underestimate what a good like foundation will do for you. And just an understanding of a lot of different things in the field. So if it's something you're interested in, Definitely, you know, continue to educate yourself, continue to follow up with people, continue to drive and try and get that role that you want to get. And you're eventually going to get there. Sage advice, Gabrielle, from somebody who's been in the field for how long at this point? I guess eight months-ish. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. It feels like it's been like two weeks, but I've loved every second. So Hopefully well, every job going for it is just like that. Like you feel like you just started every time. Yes. And don't let that imposter syndrome uh, get you down because um, you'll have individuals, even like myself, been in, in the industry for that long, going like, I, I don't feel like, like I belong here. And that that's kind of good because it makes you drive to learn more and to work harder and to keep at the top of your game. So you keep delivering at 110%. Yes, definitely. I'm giving I'm giving my first conference presentation in March, which is crazy to me. Um, but yeah, I just I'm part of me is like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't feel like I should be doing this yet. This is crazy. Um, definitely a field with a lot of imposter syndrome. And as an anxious person to begin with, it's um, a challenge. But you know, everyone belongs here is really what it kind of comes down to. If you're interested, you belong, regardless of your skill level. So where are you going to be speaking? Uh, the Women in Cybersecurity Conference in Pittsburgh. Awesome. I will be talking about medical device vulnerabilities. So it kind of goes full circle with my experience. <laughs> that is amazing. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, so, I'll also be speaking as well, um, since you brought that up at the B-Sides Nova event um, at the beginning of March. And that'll be my first conference presentation. So I'm nervous too. <laughs> Yes, I'm very excited. We can practice together. Yes, we we'll <laughs> practice together. And I, I keep telling Chris, this is all practice. You, he's going to be awesome. I mean, you're both awesome. So, oh, thanks. I know that you'll you'll both rock it. Um, so cool. Well, thank you, Gabby. We really appreciate you coming on here. I know we've been chatting about getting you on since last year. Um, and Chris and I are really excited that you were able to come share your story and just share once again, someone with such a fascinating background, such a, 
a fascinating way to break into the industry and now full circle giving a, giving a talk on the combination of all the different skills that you bring to the table. So thank you again. For sure. Thank you. Thank all you. right, guys. See everybody next week. Take Bye. care. Bye.